So before I pass this over to Val this morning, there's a few things that I did want to share with folks on the call um, regarding messaging from the division. We received some feedback and, and very much appreciate that, that there is so much information going on everywhere and from every direction right now um, that it would be helpful if we could really even tighten up more how we're sending out things via email blast. So we've done some reevaluation and made um, a concerted effort to try to make sure that the, the initial titles of those email blasts that you're receiving are tighter and clearer so that you can do a quick glance, determine if that's something that you need to keep on your radar or if that's a quick and easy delete. Um, we're also um, making sure that as timing and topics um, align, that we're combining messages into one so that you're not receiving multiple messages that are related. Also, um, we're not sending out those day before reminders on upcoming webinars. We'll send out the information, the links, and everything that you need to be able to register, but there won't be that reminder, so that'll cut down on several emails that you're receiving from us as a division. And the previous email blasts are always available on the website um, that you can go back and find, so I'll be sure to put that uh, link in the chat box. Um, sometimes, even though those topics may all fall under a COVID category, there may be times that we want to make sure we send out some pieces separate because oftentimes the, this past week is a perfect example. In trying to keep that streamlined, we included guidance, we included resources, we included the webinar reminder. Um, trying to keep that in one, I, I think that going forward at times there may be some that rise up and need that separate quick glance. So, but we will pay attention to what that is. Um, while I have you, also wanted to make sure that, you know, there was the guidance document that went out this week, um, guideline 55, and I can't tell you off the top of my head what that directive was, but so there was one piece of guidance information that came out this week. There were also a couple, two or three new resources added to the website, and we did send out an email blast regarding the video with Dr. Stanislaus and know that there uh, has been another one recorded regarding questions around the COVID vaccine, and we'll make that available as soon as it's finalized. And I think that is all that I have to share. So Val, it is you. All right, thank you, Heike. Uh, just real quick, uh, update on the numbers and what we're seeing in the data. So this is the eighth day of January. The data that I looked at today for the last seven days is effective January 1st. So we are still not seeing data in the overall data that's coming out to the state fully reflective of the Christmas and New Year's holidays. We won't probably see that until next Wednesday or Thursday. So we know that our testing was way down over the Christmas holiday, like way down. Um, that showed that our average cases were way down. That also showed that our positivity rate was way down as a state. Positivity rate is back at 20% as a state. So I know you guys know how to get to all of those web pages and look at that. If you're reading in the paper and you're thinking that things are looking pretty good, they're not, we're still not as bad as we were in November when we hit our peak. But instead of continuing to go down, we are starting to see that curve go the other direction and start going up. And we just don't know how high it will get. So pay attention to the data for us and, um, and, and we'll continue to try to keep you updated. In terms of what we're seeing for the Division of Developmental Disabilities, our community numbers to date since the beginning of the pandemic in March, so we're almost a year in now, we've had 1,548 positives, we've had 45 deaths. Our highest number of positives came in the month of November at 402. The month of December, we saw 357 positives, and we've got 59 already in the month of January. This week, we're seeing about 18 new cases on average a day come into our system. So um, don't, I, like I said, uh, you don't, I, the numbers are still where we've seen the numbers at pretty much for the whole month of December. So. Uh, Update on the testing side, we did get word that we will be able to continue to fund community provider testing, so continue to send us your invoices for COVID testing and we will get those paid for you. Um, also, on the budget side, uh, we also got word that Station MD, well, which we were continuing with Station MD anyway, but that Station MD uh, is going to also continue to be funded with the news that the coronavirus relief fund money at the federal level was extended for another year. 
So that also is really, really good information. I know the predominant thing on everybody's mind is vaccination. So I have the fall, and I'm going to try to share my screen real quick, but I'm using the wrong mouse. There. Okay, here we come. And right now, you can see that we have, I want to talk a little bit about vaccine supply. So we've had access to the vaccine in Missouri for less than a month. In fact, I'm not sure what day Pfizer got its emergency use authorizations. I'm not even sure that's been a full 30 days at this point. But actual vaccine available in the state, it has been less than a month. So there are 297,000 doses available in the state. The number, this number here reflects the actual number of first or second doses um, that are ready to be shipped and used. So they're actually here in the state. Doses available of those, 35,700 of those are the Moderna doses. And why, what it, let's talk about the differences between Moderna and Pfizer. Moderna can be stored in kind of a regular refrigerator. Pfizer has to be stored in ultra cold storage. So while we do have 172,575 doses of Pfizer available, and second Pfizer dose is 88,000 available, it is, it is more difficult to store and get out to vaccinators so that they can get it into the arm. But with that said, the state has done a really, really good job. So to date, we, the state has shipped vaccines to vaccinators, 294,850 doses. That was as of, this is, this is January 6th, and you can see by date how those doses have been shipping. So the real issue on the vaccine side is the supply and the type of vaccine that we have available. So Pfizer is, is the, the type of vaccine is fine, it's the storage issues around Pfizer that are challenging. Here is a look. So right now in the state of Missouri, we have 159,378 doses that are awaiting use or reporting. And so what we need to remind everybody is that all these vaccinators have 24 hours to report use of the vaccine so, and to show me vax. And I'm sure they're doing their best that they can to get that done. So please don't look at it and say we have 159,378 doses going unused. That is not correct. We have 159,378 that we know are out the door and are probably in process of being used at this time. Um, we did, there was 105,147 doses administered as of January 6th. Uh, 103,066 of those were first doses and we have started putting second doses into arms. 2,081 of those were second doses. You can see by day, the first date we put vaccines in arms in Missouri was on December 14th. So again, not even a month from, from now. Um, and you can see slowly how those went up and how that vaccination has been being utilized and reported. And like I said, on this date, we know these numbers will go up because they had 24 hours and this was as of January 6th. So we know those numbers will go up. Here's just a look at map of total doses administered so you can see Doses have been administered in every county in the state. Um, and it's a heat map, so you can see the most doses delivered in a county is going to be St. Louis County with 17,971. The next slide I want to show you is doses by age. And you can see that the bulk of these doses have been delivered to between 23 and 68 year olds. That is because it, the, those are the where we focus the efforts at the beginning were on our healthcare workforce and our hospitals, so that would make up the bulk of those kind of doses. The last slide I want to just show you on the supply of vaccination, and again, I understand the urgency and the frustration. We do have some good news on that front, I think, but I uh, just wanted to show you healthcare workers have received 100,000 of those doses, 2,000 have received second doses. Long-term care staff and residents had only received 2,000 doses of the estimated 126,000 we plan to give. One of the things we know this data doesn't include, and some of you are going to be familiar when I say these words, the Federal Pharmacy Partnership. So there's two vaccination efforts going on in the state right now, which is great because we want as many access points as we can get. But the two, at the two uh, efforts that are going on is the state vaccination where they're working on getting all those 1A folks vaccinated. And then some, some of our providers, long-term care facilities, signed up under the Federal Pharmacy Partnership. That is a second vaccination effort. And we know that vaccination effort is also underway right now in the state. 
Uh, they're still working on most of that vaccination is done through CVS and Walgreens, and we are still working on getting the data transferred for those vaccination efforts. So those are not reflected in this number right now, but that is information we are working on getting collected. So again, I don't want you to forget, let's go back. The first doses of vaccine in Missouri went into the arms on December 14th, okay? So we're not even a month into this. This is where our supply is at right now. So stick with us. Um, some other good news, and I'm gonna stop sharing this now. Hold on. Can't multitask always. Okay, so thank you, Heiken, for giving me the ball. Uh, the other thing I did wanna share on the vaccine front is that um, I believe on Monday, so I know that the Department of Health and Senior Services yesterday notified the 1A vaccinators. So the folks that across the state, pharmacies, whoever, that signed up to be one category 1A vaccinators to let to make sure that all of their information was correct. And they are we are releasing that information on Monday, January 11th to everyone. So if you have not been able to identify a vaccination partner at this time, that may be another avenue of phone numbers, people that you can call to find vaccination partners. Um, we are specifically listed in the 1A guidance that goes out to the 1A providers. It says DMH facilities. It also says DMH contracted residents and staff. It is specifically lined out. You will have access to that information on, on Monday. If you call a 1A vaccinator and they say you're not on the 1A list, honestly, I would go to another vaccinator, but you also can refer them back to that and say, yes, I am. I fall into this category. So all of that is coming to you on Monday. In the meantime, the division, anybody who replied to the division survey about needing a vaccinator, how many people they needed to get vaccinated, we have shared that with the Pharmacy Association. And I know some of you is, um, have, some of you have been contacted by different pharmacies. So another thing that I may suggest to you, um, and this goes back to where we talked about the different types of vaccinations available in the state. The bulk of the vaccination in this state right now available is Pfizer. Pfizer has to be kept in ultra-cold storage. Once it is out of ultra-cold storage, it has to be used in five days. So it may benefit some of you to work together and approach a pharmacy together because they get 950 doses when you get a tray of Pfizer vaccine. And none of us have 950 people in one location to vaccinate. But if you can work together as providers and approach some of these pharmacies, it may make it easier for them to make an order for the Pfizer vaccine, and it may be able to get shots and arms quicker for you. So I um, wanted to share that information as well. I'm going to scroll through the chat really quick. Uh, honestly, someone said that someone's unmuted and typing, and it's loud. Um, but I think it was me clicking my pen, so I apologize for that, and I will put it down. Um, then there's a question about the Appendix K, which is not for me. Um, and I think I'm good. Oh, wait, hold on. There's one more here. Oh, Appendix K, sorry, let me go down. Um, what number again to pro providers call to identify a vaccinator partner? I did not give out a phone number yet. There will be phone numbers available on Monday. So we will be working with folks to get access to that information on Monday. Um, also, is there a list of vaccinators available? Yes, there will be a list of vaccinators available on Monday, January 11th. I think that's Monday. I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, it is. So hold tight for Monday to get that information. Right now, the vaccinators that are on that list, what we did was, what the state did was they notified them and they said, listen, we want to make sure all of your information is out here correctly because we are going to be giving this to all the 1A providers on Monday. They may call you before Monday and talk to you, but I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Okay, I am done, so let's move it on to Leslie. Thanks, Val. I just have a quick update on the Appendix K additive amendment that we have submitted through MoHealthNet to CMS to extend the Appendix K end date to no later than six months after the expiration of the public health emergency. So that approval is currently pending, and stay tuned. That's all I've got. Thanks, Leslie. I think I'll take it at this point. This is Kim Stock. Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to expand on what Val shared with you in regards to communication and vaccine updates for the community. 
um, as Val alluded to. So anyone who has completed, and thank you all of you who have, um, we had 1,888 as of yesterday survey respondents for um, providing us their information and requesting information back on the vaccine. We did send out a, a communication update this week on what we knew at that time. And as Val alluded to, um, early next week on Monday, we will start directly communicating with any agency that submitted um, and responded to our survey link. And so we're gonna be providing you specifically with the information that we will be receiving on the vaccinator contact information, as well as how that communication flow um, should support um, the vision of you making that connection with the vaccinator. So be looking that um, from your designated contact again, that completed that survey link. If any of you have not completed the survey and are wanting that direct contact information for your respective counties of service, please um, respond to us in the vaccinator mailbox link that I've provided in the chat today. And we will be more than happy um, to coordinate and provide you with your um, specific information. Also had a question in the chat um, privately in regards to does the division, would the division like to have information back from agencies um, on your efforts of when you receive the vaccine? Yes, that would be great. If you have the time and you would um, like to share that information with us, we would be more than happy to add that to the tracking that we're doing around the, the division's vaccination efforts. And we would definitely appreciate um, if you could report that back to us, similar to what we've been doing with our testing efforts. Um, as I also mentioned, just want to share that I know um, it's been challenging for everyone right now trying to get connected locally and get those lines of communication with the vaccinators. Um, really hopeful that um, our efforts next week will start to streamline that process and make it a little easier for all of you. Um, but please continue to send us any um, questions, roadblocks that you may be encountering so that we can continue our frontline um, lines of effort to support you um, locally when you're reaching out to those vaccinators. And I think that is all that I got on that front today. Just as a reminder, as Val mentioned also, in regards to testing efforts, we are continuing to, to support everyone in that front. Um, so continue to send your, your requests and your information and questions to us through the testing mailbox. And I've again provided that link again in the chat. And I think that's all I had um, other than what Val had highlighted already today. Appreciate everybody's continued efforts. And I'll turn it over to Wendy. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just have a couple really quick things. Um, in response to some requests and feedback from our provider network, we have re-implemented the expedited UR process effective here in January. So um, we also have teams that are working on related issues around the ability to get service authorized quickly and the turnaround times on that. Um, so we do have teams working on that and there'll be more information to come. So thank you for that. And also the pilot project, there was a pilot project um, in central Missouri and southwest Missouri that was focused on working with providers who had people that were using um, intensive uh, amounts of staffing hours. And that pilot project has been suspended at this time. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to share and, and encourage and remind is that we realize that our provider network is really stretched thin, both from a financial and a staffing resource perspective. If you are in a position that you may need to scale back on your services or the number of people that you serve or discontinue any services that you're currently contracted to do, um, please, please reach out to your local PR teams. They are there to help you um, problem solve and see if we can't find solutions to help relieve some of the stress for our provider network during this time. So they are really there want to help in any way they can. So don't hesitate to reach out to them and let them know um, if you're struggling with something. That's what we're here for. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Val and team, and if there's any questions that have come up in the chat to follow up with. All right. Thanks, All right. Wendy. Um, I'm now undouble muted, um, so that's good. So there's a question that we got in the chat. Is 1A for people receiving residential services only? What about people not connected with DMH, i.e. those working in workshops? So it actually is for anybody kind of in those congregate settings that is getting that, that, is getting that type of care. If, again, if you are calling, it will be the responsibility, though, of that provider to call and get the vaccination, okay? 
Now, I will say some vaccinators will reach out to you because that's how they are operating, but don't wait for someone to call you. If you are in one of those other, you know, not quite so obvious categories, you do still qualify as 1A, you should still be reaching out. But that will be the provider's responsibility, okay? So they will need to be doing that. And like I said, we will continue to share that guidance across the board. Uh, the next question I got, do people who receive day services but live in natural homes qualify in the first round? The answer is yes. There is actually adult daycares qualify, day have, all of that stuff will be defined in the definitions. It won't explicitly say that in the um, 1A document that went out to the vaccinators, because we have to keep that short, guys. But there's a definition document that backs that up, and it does specifically say that. So, yes, they do. And, again, it will be incumbent on those providers to work getting their the folks that they support and their staff vaccinated. This is 1A is the phase of vaccination where the vaccinators come to you. It's not that you go to a place to get vaccinated or you line up. So I wanted to make sure that was clear. Another question, does the vaccine supply apply to TCM agencies? At this time, TCM agencies are not 1A. We are working on the 1B categorization. And the definition that we're working on in the 1B categorization is social services first responders. TCM agencies would qualify as a social services first responder. So I, we, I cannot confirm that yet because the 1B classifications have not been finalized yet. You saw the numbers. We still have quite a ways to go on the 1A side. But the intent is to get the TCM agencies really, and that should be the, once we get the TCM agencies in, and then anyone 18 to 64 or 65 and above with, 65 and above or 18 to 64 with chronic conditions will also fall in that 1B category. At that point, we should predominantly be covered through the vaccination, 1A and mm -hmm. 1B. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, asking about survey, not supply. Yes, sorry, thank you for that follow-up question. Yes, and I should have thought about that quick more. Yeah, TCM agencies, if you want to reply to the survey, please do so. I think that is fine. We'll just mark you more in the 1B category, and that, that's okay, too. So, all right, Kim, I hear you yeah. on there, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I, just if I could quickly add, um, we've had some great examples and appreciate the communication from the field. Um, I want to emphasize, as Val mentioned, when you can make that connection with a vaccinator and you're in, that doesn't immediately mean that you're going to be um, immediately receiving the vaccine, though, and so everyone needs to keep that in mind. Um, that connection is the first line of effort, and then secondly, working operationally with your vaccinator in that communication plan for when you will be targeted to actually start to receive the vaccine. And so that is varying right now across the state from county to county, so just keeping that, that in is, mind. Yeah, and that is very dependent on supply available. And there was another really great question here, so I want to bring that up. For someone providing self-directed support personal assistance, how do they access the vaccine since they don't have a provider requesting it? So what we would call that, um, I'll answer that next question in a second. What we would call that is either, uh, we would call that a non-affiliated healthcare provider. And there are ways in 1A for people to access vaccine from a vaccinator as a non-affiliated healthcare provider. So you will need to reach out as a non-affiliated healthcare provider because that's what you're that's what you're considered. You will need to reach out to a vaccinator and say, "Hey, I qualify as 1A, but I'm only three people. Where do I need to go to get the vaccination?" And so think about small dental clinics; they're kind of in the same boat as self-directed PA. Okay, so there's going to be vaccinators will be setting up clinics for their 1A folks but you will need to be reaching out to them to figure out where that is. And in that case, you will go to the vaccine, uh, but you will need to be reaching out um, on that once that, that list is released. The other one that I got, and I know it says the audio is cutting out pretty bad, and I'm sorry about that. I'm as close to the phone as I can get, is uh, are children with developmental disabilities included in 1B? The vaccine is currently not approved for anyone under the age of 16. So children are not included in any category at this time. Doesn't matter if they have a developmental disability or not. The vaccine is not approved for anyone under the age of 16 at this point. Um, and then the other one, oh, the audio is cutting out pretty bad. Sorry, trying, we're doing our best. Um, I don't have any other questions in the chat at this time. I do appreciate the urgency for the vaccination. I 100% appreciate it. 
And I just hope that we gave you some information today that you, because I know you're getting that pressure from your guardians, from your employees. I completely understand where that pressure is coming from. I hope the answers we were able to give you today, the information we were able to give you today will help you answer those questions as well. But I am really, really optimistic at how, um, how the, the next few weeks in this state are going to work in, relates, in relationship to vaccination. And as long as we can get the, vaccinate, the vaccinations to those 1A vaccinators, I know just based off what we've experienced so far, they will work quickly. And, and you need to be ready because what oftentimes happens is you get a call on Monday that they want to vaccinate you on Wednesday. So be thinking about all the things you need to be doing so that you have, um, so that you have, you're ready and you can jump as soon as you get that, that opportunity. All right. I don't have anything else. So happy new year, everyone. Stay safe. Watch the numbers. Remember, even though we have vaccinations, until we have that reproductive rate below one, and I want it below 0.5, we are still wearing masks, we are still washing hands, we are still, unfortunately, having the physical distance. And all those, all those things have to continue until the reproductive rate is down and we have enough people vaccinated. So help us with that. If you need help with mis-busting and education, it takes a lot of it. You're going to have to continually do it, but I know that we could get it done. Good luck, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks. Bye.